Well, Heavenly Father, we just pray that you'll come with us today, Lord, and open your word in our hearts. Uh, anoint me to, to deliver your word today. We just ask that, Jesus, in your wonderful name. Amen. Well, my message today is a little different. Don't go to hell. Oh. Please. Reminds me of a time when we were doing a program in I have a trick that I ended with. It was a card, and I flipped the card. I might have done that here, and, and the arrows on the card point different directions. Mm -hmm. and I talk about people going all different directions in their life, and I say that'll eventually lead them. And you point the card, and it points down. And I said it'll lead them to it'll lead them to a place called hell. And the little boy, <gasps> he goes, "You just swore." <laughs> And I said, no. I said, but you know what? The devil has turned hell into a swear word so nobody will talk about it. Come on. You know, we bring it up and they don't talk about it in the churches anymore. They used to preach on hell a lot. And uh, recently Mark pointed out a sermon to me by Jonathan Edwards. He was a preacher during the first great awakening in America. It happened during the colonial days. And he preached a sermon that is studied even today. It's called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. You ever get a chance, look that up online and read it. Talk about fire and brimstone. And they look at that as an example of the fire and brimstone preaching that caused the Great Awakening. What was interesting about it is I studied it. Jonathan Edwards, they said, was a very soft-spoken man. You, you, we think of that type of preaching that the person is just shouting and yelling and pounding the pulpit. No, he's very soft-spoken, and he read his sermon. And he gave many different points. Every point, he read different stories in the Bible to, to back up his point. And so today, we don't always respond to that kind of preaching. But they had to listen carefully. But what was interesting is as he was preaching the sermon, people would stop him in the middle of the sermon and cry out, How can I get saved? What do I need to do to get saved? And he'd keep on preaching. And by the time he got in, imagine the, the altar call. Yeah. I'm not sure how they did that back then, but praying for people to accept the Lord. Fiery sermon. You know, it said that um, Jesus spoke more about hell than any other person in the Bible. Some say that he spoke more, he talked more on hell than he did on heaven. And that's a kind of a debated issue. It depends on whether you take the scriptures where he directly said hell. If you take the, the scriptures where he directly mentioned hell, it's not more than heaven was mentioned. But if you take every scripture where it talked about punishment and what was going to happen if you were a sinner, he talked more about that than he did about heaven. Well, I ran across a question on the, that somebody had wrote to the Billy Graham organization on their website. And this person asked, did Jesus ever say anything about hell? That was the question. Obviously, this person doesn't read their Bible, but they know that he did mention it. They said, I don't believe in hell myself. I believe God is a God of love and wouldn't send anyone to hell. I think preachers who talk about hell all the time are just trying to scare people into believing in their religion. And I thought this question kind of spells out the attitude today. A lot of preachers today won't preach about hell. Because they're afraid of offending somebody. Because this is what everybody is, is beginning to believe, that God won't send anybody to hell. There is no such place as hell. Because God is a loving God. He is. But that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that there is a place called hell. A place of punishment. See that Jesus not only talked about the reality of hell, He talked about it more than any other person in the Bible. Like I just mentioned he talked about it because he wanted us to know that God has provided a way of escape. Exactly. That's why he talked about it. He brought it up to let people know, this is where you're headed. But if you do the right thing, you can escape that. Yes. Exactly. He loves us and he wants us to spend eternity with him. That's why he's talked about it. That's why we should talk about it. We should let people know that there is a place of punishment that they're heading towards. This idea of just telling them that God is a loving God and everybody's going to go to heaven, and they say, well, I don't need to do anything, man. I'll just live my life the way I'm living it because I'm going to go to heaven. That's just not true. You see, in Jonathan Edwards preached, he let people know that there's an angry God, angry against sin, and at any moment, 
could be your moment when he reaches down and takes hold of you and casts you into eternal fire. And people responded to that. But we don't want to preach that anymore today. We want to preach these feel-good messages. Everybody feels good. Nobody's going to get punished. Doesn't matter what you do. And you talk to people, most people say, well, yeah, I think the murderers and some of these people like Hitler, yeah, they go to some place. But everybody else goes to heaven. We're going to examine that. What did Jesus tell us about hell? What does the Bible tell us about hell? What kind of place is it? We need to know that because we need to warn people. That's our job. That's the Great Commission. To go and spread the good news of the gospel. What is the gospel? That Jesus Christ died for our sins, rose again from the dead, that we might go to heaven and be with him. Matthew 13, 41 through 42. The Son of Man will send forth his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all stumbling blocks and those who commit lawlessness, and will throw them into the furnace of fire in a place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This one verse where this place of eternal torment is mentioned. I was reading an interesting little illustration. And it's a, about a Brooklyn traffic officer that handed a woman a ticket. And she told him, according to the press report, you can go to hell. When she appeared in court, the magistrate dismissed the officer's complaint about her language saying, it wasn't a command or a wish, but a real statement of fact. The officer complained that she had swore to it. Huh. The judge is saying, no, that was a real statement of fact, for going to hell is a possibility. <laughs> Think about that. That was almost the title of my message. You can go to hell, but I thought putting that on the <laughs> board out there might be nice. <laughs> A little too much. But, but you know what? I was in the back, and you know how sometimes God confirms things? I was nervous about this message. Nervous about how people are going to receive it, how they're going to accept it. I, I was struggling with it. I told my wife on the way in, I'm just struggling. It's like I'm being attacked. Yes. Almost a feeling of, of anxiety or depression. And she prayed for me on the way in. Well, I'm in there having my coffee, and I look at the bookshelf, and I haven't seen these on the bookshelf before, but little track says, go to hell. <laughs> I thought, wait, God's speaking to me. I haven't I'm seen supposed to be either. preaching this message. Yeah, but again, today, a lot of people want to take out of the Bible anything that's offensive. And I was looking on the shelf, and I saw a Bible as a, kind of an example of what people do. Here's half a Bible up there. I don't know why we have half a Bible on the shelf. But you know, a lot of people, their Bibles are like that. They've taken out everything that they find offensive. And they're only trying to keep... Feel good the feel-good part. Now look at Mark's Bible. Look at, hold that up, Mark. That's like mine at home. I didn't break mine, but it's a nice, big, thick Bible. That's God's Word. But a lot of people, His Word's just this little thin thing. Only the passages they want to read. Yeah, it does say in the Bible that God is love. That's not all it says. But they tear out all the things that, that offend them. They don't want to read verses like this that talk about a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's not pleasant. Nobody wants to go there. There was a girl that was dying in the hospital. And she said to her father, Why didn't you tell me there was such a place? And he said, What place? A hell. He said, Jenny? He said, There is no such place. God is merciful. There will be no future suffering. She said, I know better. I am slipping in the, into eternity this moment. And I'm lost. Mm -hmm. Why did you not tell me there was such a place? You see, we need to tell others, don't we? Yeah. Imagine that on the deathbed, realizing that you're slipping into eternity, that you weren't given the truth. Yeah. See, I know when I stand in heaven, I don't want anybody standing before me on the day of judgment pointing their finger at me and saying, why didn't you tell me? Yeah. You had a chance. Why didn't you tell me that there was a better way? None of us should ever have to face that. We need to tell people the truth. So what does the Bible tell us about this place called hell? It tells us it's a place of fire. Some people say, oh, there's no fire in hell. That's not really. But that's what the Bible says. It says in Matthew 13, 42, you can jot these down if you want and look them up. It says it's a furnace of fire. We just read from that. 
Matthew 25, 41 says it's an everlasting fire. How long is everlasting? Forever. Mark 9, 43 through 48 says it's an unquenchable fire. So the Bible tells us it's a place of fire. We're also going to find it tells us some things that seem to contradict that, but it, it, it's hard to completely understand. It's a fire that never quenches, never goes out. A place of eternal burning and torment. Not a place I would want to be. Not a place I would want anybody I love to go. 2 Samuel 22.6 tells us it's a place of sorrows. That means there's no happiness there. I've heard some young people, teenagers say, I want to go to hell because that's where the party's going to be. This doesn't tell me about a party. <laughs> See, they have this idea that heaven, everybody's just got to stand around and be good, and they don't want that. They want to go to hell because they're going to be drinking and drugs and party and just a good time. I don't know where they get that idea because that's not what my Bible talks about. But I have heard that. See, it's a place of sorrow. I don't want to have sorrow. I want to have joy. It's also a place of outer darkness. You find that in Matthew 8, 12, 13, 42, 13, 50, and 25, 23. A number of places it talks about outer darkness. What does that mean? Outer darkness means outside of the light of God. It's outside in darkness. Complete darkness. Jude 13 says, Wild waves of the sea. This is after he's talking about those that rebel against God. Casting up their own shame like foam, wandering stars, for whom the black darkness has been reserved forever. The black darkness. What is that like? I know as a young boy, when we went camping up in, in Lassen Park, there were some caves that we went into. And we were taking this tour into these lava tubes in these caves, and you get back so far, and they turn the lights off. So you could see what absolute darkness was like. And you could feel it. If you've not experienced that, it's not experience. I mean, you can close off a room, try and turn off all the lights, but to get absolute darkness where there's absolutely no light at all, you have to be in a place like that, you can feel it pressing in on you. And they don't leave it that way too long. I mean, because people begin to panic just within a few minutes, you know, turn the lights back on. <laughs> because then your imagination begins to go wild. People begin to hallucinate that they're left in them. They begin to hear things, see things that aren't there. That's outer darkness. And it kind of conflicts with the place of burning. Obviously, the burning in hell doesn't give off light. If it's outer darkness, I would have to assume that. And the reason there's no light there is because God's presence isn't there. See, God is light. We learned that in Wednesday night studying in the book of John. It says Jesus is the light. He is the light of the world. If Jesus is not there, there is no light. We learned that in the millennium when Jesus reigns on earth, that he is going to be the source of the light yes. on the earth. He is the source of light. It's a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. Doesn't sound very pleasant, does it? So what does that talk about? Weeping and gnashing of teeth. In the original language, when it speaks of the weeping, it's speaking of a deep emotional pain. Not just shedding a few tears. This is a deep emotional pain that overcomes you. And gnashing of teeth speaks of physical pain. So there's not only deep emotional pain there, there's deep physical pain as well. I hope as we begin to understand what this place is like, you begin to realize that you shouldn't want anybody to go there. Nobody should go there. This is eternal. It says it lasts forever. See, there's this idea that people go to hell only for a short period of time and then sometimes they get out of there. That's not what the scripture says. It says it's everlasting. When you're lost, you're lost. You know, how is that fair? It's fair because Jesus paid the price. Right. And you're going to hear that over and over from this pulpit. Nobody can stand before God and say it's not fair. Because He paid the price Himself. It's not His fault that people didn't accept it. That's, right. That's their choice. That's right. Some people openly refuse it. Yes. They're setting their own eternity 
And it was read, it was said that those that refuse God's love, God's free gift, have to trip over the broken body of Jesus as they're going to hell. Because they had to have known. See, I believe that every person at some point in their life before they die, given that opportunity, whether it's in those last moments of consciousness, I believe God gives them an opportunity. I don't believe that anybody passes from this earth without being given the opportunity to accept Christ and accept what He did. We don't always see it. If, we don't always know it. But if you're praying for your loved ones, they're being given a chance. You know, we had the, the blessing to pray with Gail's father just shortly before he died to accept Christ as his Savior. And he had a few things God wanted to deal with him on the day that he died. And he dealt with him and he passed that night. But you know, as he was passing, he could see the, the, the gate, the door to heaven. He kept saying, open the door. Please open that door for me. It was a really spiritual moment. But God had something to deal with him on. He had always taken the Lord's name in vain. You know, that's something people do all the time. And it's something we really need to... One day I'm going to do a message on just that. What that means is using God's name meaningless. You hear people say, oh my, and use God's name. Or oh, they say Jesus. And they don't even think about it. See, that's using it meaningless. Her father went kind of beyond that. He uses the curse word. And he kept asking us that day, he said, what's that verse? What's that verse? Could you read me that verse? And I'm like, I'm scrambling, I'm looking at it. Gail and we're looking at each other. She says, I think he means the Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. So I started reading the Ten Commandments. I got to the commandment that says, Thou shalt not take the Lord thy God's name in vain. And he said, That's it. He says, How do you stop doing that? Mm -hmm. See, God had his thumb on him and saying, Bill, you're coming home. You can see the door, but we got to deal with something first. Yes, and we prayed with him that God would forgive him. And that's what Gail said. He said, Dad, you just need to ask him to forgive you. And he'll help you to not do that. And he passed that evening. That was the final thing. It was like he was ready to go. But God said, okay, I'm, uh, you can see the door, but I'll open it up. Because we kept telling him, I can't open that door for you. Only Jesus could open it. That door opened later because he dealt with it. So that tells me that's kind of important to God. So we need to think about that. It's also a place of everlasting destruction. 2 Thessalonians 1.9. Again, what does that word everlasting mean? It lasts for a year? 10 years? 100 years? No, it lasts forever. Everlasting destruction. It's a place of no rest. Revelation 14.11. How many like to get their rest once in a while? I wouldn't want to be a place where you could never rest. Oh, constant turmoil. <laughs> I would want that. <laughs> Constantly being tormented. That's why you can't rest. You can't get away from it is what that's talking about. Yeah. There's no rest from the torment. <clears throat> See, when God instructed man to rest on the seventh day, it was a type of the millennial reign. When Jesus is going to come to the earth and reign as our king, it will be a time of rest. <clears throat> Time of rejoicing. This is heaven is also a time of rest for those that pass before his coming. Before the resurrection, it's a time of rest and rejoicing in the presence of the Lord. But hell is not that. It's a place of no rest. You know, when a question comes up sometimes, it says, if God is omnipresent, if he is everywhere at once, then he should be in, exist in hell as well. But that's not what Scripture tells me. God can choose. He can be anywhere. But He can choose to remove His presence from some place as well. Because He is omnipotent. He is not in hell. There's no comfort. But there is an alternative. Come on. We want to end on a good note. There's an alternative to going to that place called hell. It's a place called heaven. One Sunday morning, a faithful Sunday school teacher was teaching her class of boys about heaven. She asked the question, where is heaven? How many of you have ever asked that question? Wonder where it is. 
And one happy boy replied, it's in our home since my daddy became a Christian. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Kind of powerful, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Another one I thought was good is the story of Matthew Henry. How many have ever read Matthew Henry, Matthew Henry commentary? It's one of the most popular Bible commentaries. He was a great theologian. But as a poor and unknown young man, he wished to marry a girl whose father was wealthy and who did not approve of the marriage. The father argued that although he was a good scholar and an excellent preacher, they did not even know where he came from. Dad saying to me, I don't even know where you came from. I don't know your background. I don't care about how good a preacher you are. Where do you come from? The daughter had a ready answer. She said, but father, she said, we know where he's going, and I want to go with him. <coughs> he was on his way to heaven. She wanted to go with him. She said, I don't care where he's come from. I want to go where he's going. Amen. If you have any singles, that's an important thing to remember. We're looking for a mate. You want somebody where you know where they're going so that you'll go with them. Heaven is a place of no mores. Where hell we just read was a place of all kinds of bad things. Doesn't sound like a good place to be. But heaven is a place of no mores. Just the opposite. Revelation 21, 3 through 4 says, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. Mm -hmm. We just stop there, how powerful that is. Mm -hmm. God himself is going to be with us. Yes. He is going to be present with us in heaven. How wonderful is that going to be? <laughs> to be in the Lord's presence. And it says that he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and there will be no longer be any death. There's one no more. No more death. Yes. Isn't that wonderful? Powerful. Think about that. How many fear death? <laughs> it's not an idea that appeals to me because it's kind of an unknown. And probably if most of us were honest, what we fear as Christians more than anything, maybe not where we're going, but the manner of death. Not knowing how it's going to happen. What we're going to have to go through. But we don't have to worry about that. Once we're in the Lord's presence. We won't die again. Which is really interesting when you think about it. After Jesus returns, those that die before His return and are raised first. And then those of us that are, are still here are raised with Him. Given glorified bodies. These are bodies that will no longer see death. When Jesus reigns on earth for a thousand years, we're going to reign with Him on earth in bodies that won't see death. We'll be immortal. The millennium is a really interesting period of time to study because there's going to be immortal people on the earth. But there's also going to be people who came out of the tribulation and got saved that are not immortal. That are going to be having children, giving birth, that are going to be mortal. There'll be a combination of immortal and mortal people on the earth. It's going to be an interesting period of time. It says there will be no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. So no more sadness. Remember, hell is a place of sorrows. But it tells us heaven there is no sorrow. Only joy in the presence of the Lord. Wow. I like that. No crying. So somehow in heaven, even if we have loved ones that refuse to accept Christ as their Savior and they don't make it there, we're not going to cry over it. We're not going to mourn their loss. That's hard to understand, but somehow that's the way it's going to be. Because we're going to have complete and total understanding of God's plan and purpose and how everything works. So it'll only be joy. And it says there'll be no pain. Well, that's a good one. How many ever feel pain? <laughs> Some of us deal with it every day, don't we? Get up in the morning with aches and pains and we just push our way through, take what we can to relieve it and try to get on with the day. Just push through the pain. But we learn to do that. But we won't have to. In heaven, there'll be no pain. Wow, that's a pretty wonderful thing. So it's the first things have passed away. The former things. 
So what does that mean? What are these former things that have passed away? What's passed away is the mourning, the crying, the pain, the sickness, the death. All those things are going to pass away. All things are going to be new. We're going to be as God intended us to be. God did not intend us to live in these pain-ridden bodies that, that wear out over time. And who knows what's going to go on with them in the next year or two. I used to tell people after I turned 40, I said, you know, once you turn 40, things are either growing on you or falling off of you. <laughs> I like to tell people that when they get their 40th birthday. Guess what? Now you're at that stage in life where things are either going to grow on you or fall off of you. Goodness. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just the fact of life, but we can't get away from it. And as you get older, you get to a point where you go, why didn't anybody tell us what it was like to be this age? <laughs> older people, I mean, we tend not to tell younger kids what it's going to be like. We just like to let them be surprised. <laughs> and they look at us and go, why didn't you tell us? Well, my parents didn't tell me. <laughs> surprise. <laughs> it's not fun growing older but nothing we have any control over is it yeah. but you know what there's a time when we won't have to worry about any of that mm -hmm. I have questions often asked people say well how old are we going to be in heaven the Bible doesn't tell us but I know I, it seems like that 30 years old was a very important age in the scriptures so I just kind of figure we'll be around that age unless there was an age you like better you could probably choose the age that you're going to be <laughs> in heaven but that seemed like a that was a good time in life that's about the time you're mature enough that you're putting away childish things you're usually in pretty good health don't have any pain so i just think because that was the age that you became a priest in the old testament that's the age that Christ began his ministry. So that's just a guess of mine. I figure I'll be around 30 years old in my, my glorified body. No, sometimes I don't want to be a kid again. That, that was kind of rough. <laughs> but I have a feeling we can choose what age we want to be. The interesting thing in heaven, it says we will be known as we were known. People recognize you instantly. When you go on to be in heaven, even in that time between the resurrection of your physical body at the time you're there, people will know you exactly as you were known. It's Since not a passing days. away and then suddenly we don't remember who we were or lose all that. We retain all our memory. What do you think? It says something about our soul, our individual souls, and who we are, that we're recognized by our soul, that you know, God gave us. Yeah, we will be recognized. Well, if I run into you, I'll know exactly who you were. <laughs> <laughs> Praise God, it's going to be a wonderful place. Those are the alternatives. So think about our loved ones. How many have loved ones, family, that don't know the Lord? I have some very doubtful. We need to be praying for them every single day. You know, and sometimes God chooses somebody else to lead them to Him. It's for us as family, a lot of times we're the last person that they'll listen to. So one of the things you need to pray is pray that God will put somebody in their life that they'll listen to, a Christian. I like to pray that they'll run into a Christian witness. Whether they go forward or backwards or one side or the other, they're always running into somebody that's sharing with them the love of God. But I believe that nobody comes to know the Father, nobody comes to know Jesus unless somebody is praying for them. That's because until you know the Lord as your Savior, according to what I understand in Scriptures, your prayers aren't heard. It's the prayers of a Christian that lead you to God. That's how I got saved. Somebody prayed for me. I was heading in the wrong direction. But you know what? As somebody began to pray for me, the Holy Spirit began to work on me. And I began to feel conviction for my life and what I was doing. And I was looking for something, but I didn't know what. And I finally found it. I found Jesus as my Savior. So we need to pray for our loved ones. You may not like your neighbors, but do you really want them to go to the place that I described? Just because you don't get along with them doesn't mean that they should be punished forever. You need to pray for your neighbors. The Bible says we're to love our neighbors. Who's your neighbor? Anybody you run into is your neighbor. 
So that's, as Christians, we need to understand that there is a real place of torment and punishment that was not prepared for mankind to go there. That's the other thing we need to understand. People say, well, why would God create a place like hell? It was a place to send the devil and the fallen angels. Those that rebelled against him. Well, like I like to tell children, when we minister to them, I say, you know what? The devil hates everything God loves. And God loves you. And if he can drag you there with him and break God's heart, he's going to try to do that. But you know what? One of the things that misunderstanding about hell is hell is not a place where Satan is sitting on a throne ruling over you. That's not what the Bible says. It's a place where he is going to be cast to be punished. He doesn't rule in hell. Satan isn't ruling from hell now. He wanders the earth. It's what the scriptures say. He's going to be cast into the lake of fire eventually. It says hell and the devil will be cast into the lake of fire. And will be no more. A different level of punishment. There will be no escape from the lake of fire. Because it tells us he's going to be cast into the pit for a thousand years and then released at the end of the millennium <clears throat> for a short time and then cast into the lake of fire with the final judgment. So you got to get that mental picture out of your mind that he's some kind of ruler. He's not. He's a liar. Yes. Yes. He wants you to believe that he's all powerful and all knowing and all sinning. He's not. Yes. Only God is. Mm -hmm. He was a created being. Not an eternal being. Sometimes we give him way too much credit. And it seems the world right now is, is trying to paint him as something he isn't. There's a new series, I believe, starting tomorrow night called Lucifer. Mm -hmm. And if you saw the commercials on it, he's just this happy to look, go lucky guy. Lucifer came to Earth for a vacation and he's just cool and looks like he's a you know, man about town. I don't know all what the series is about, but just from the commercials, I know it's right out of the pit of hell. A lie trying to paint him in a favorable light. The more and more you're seeing programming like that. Because they're trying to push the world in the wrong direction. We as the church need to be leading the world in the right direction. That's our job. So church, get out there. Tell people about the Lord. Invite them to church. Next week is a good opportunity. Bring a friend. Tell them we're going to have a chili cook-off. Come to a chili cook-off. Mm. Put them in your car. Grab them by the arm and lead them in. Let's fill this place up. Amen. We're going to have some good chili and a good time. But they're going to hear the Word of God as well. Bow our heads. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we thank You and praise You so much for Your Word. Lord, I thank You for Your Word here in Revelation. That tells us there will be no longer any death, no mourning, no crying, no pain. That all the former things like that will pass away. That all things will be new. We thank you for that, Jesus. We look forward to that time. If there's anybody here today that has not asked Christ to come into your life as your Savior, without anybody looking around, and you'd like to be included in my closing prayer, slip your hand up. I want to pray for you today to accept Christ as your Savior. Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for these that are here today. I pray your blessing to be upon them, Lord. Bless them today as they go from this place. Lord, continue to minister to our hearts the word that we heard. And when we see opportunity to share your love with someone else, give us the boldness and the words to share, Lord. Lord, I thank you that you don't leave us alone. You, you sent your Holy Spirit to comfort us and to guide us and to give us strength and to give us the words to speak. Sometimes it's so difficult. We know that we need to share with somebody and we don't know how to do it, but you have the words ready for us. Put them on our lips, Lord, that we'll speak them and share them. Lord, I pray for all these that raise their hands and say that they have family members that don't know you. I pray for them right now, Lord, that by your Holy Spirit you begin to draw them in, Lord. Convict them of their sins. Convict them of their lives. That they'll desire a change and they'll begin to seek that, Lord. And, and every time they turn around, let them look, run into a witness, Lord. Somebody that will tell them about your love. 
and tell them the truth of your gospel, Jesus. We ask that, Jesus, in your wonderful name. Amen. Amen.